morning to everybody online. This is wild. I have graduated from singing to speaking. So crazy. So, you know, we've been in this series called Heed the Call, right? And if you've ever, have you ever heard something so many times that it kind of loses its meaning? Heed the call, right? We've been in this series all year long and all year long I've been thinking about you guys. I've been like, yes, come on Shoreline, let's get it, let's heed the call. I'm up here, I'm heeding, I'm singing every other week doing my thing. And then they ask me to do this and I'm like, no, absolutely not. I think it's so easy for us to heed the call for someone else. You know, and then after months and months of thinking about other people who should be doing it, and then God is like, no, Anna, I have more for you. So this is me heeding my call this morning. Thank you, thank you. It's very scary, but we're going for it. We're doing it. Um, You know, and if I'm honest, though, in my quiet time with God about a year ago, he has actually been preparing me for this. A lot of you in this room, you've been following God for a while, and you know how you're gifted, you know how you're wired, you know where your yes needs to be. And even as I'm speaking right now, if you're honest with yourself, it's coming to mind and you're you're thinking about how can I also go out? Maybe, hopefully. And maybe for others in this room, this is new to you and and you're not sure. And maybe you just have the courage to lean in and to listen this morning. So I'm gonna pray for us because I need it and then we're gonna get started. So God, we just thank you so much for who you are. We grab hold of you this morning. We pray that you would inspire us, that you would move us, and that you would give us your perspective. We love you and we are here for you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I recently picked up line dancing. It's super fun. I have such a great time. You can learn all of the YouTube videos at home and you can learn them in your living room and you can practice them in front of your husband like a psychopath. It's so much fun. You know, and there's this one line dance that I really wanted to learn. So I go out one night and sure enough, they play it and I'm like, oh, I know this one. I'm so good at it. And I get out there and it's time for the turn. And so I go with confidence for the turn and now everybody else is looking back at me. And if you've ever been line dancing, that is the worst thing that can happen. You should just go home. You should just leave. And I did, I did. I was very discouraged. I was very embarrassed. Um, I actually thought about it for an entire week, which was like such a waste of time, right? Um, And I share that with you because I think one of the reasons that we don't heed our call is for fear of failure, fear of embarrassment, And that can't just be true of us today, right? In fact, we know that that's not true of just us today because when we look back in the Bible and we think about all of the people who God has called to do extraordinary things, Moses comes to mind. And you think about what was Moses' response to God when he called him to free the Israelites. So we pick up in Exodus 3, 9, and God tells him, so because the Israelites cry for help has come to me, and I've also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, therefore go. Like, can you imagine what Moses was feeling in that moment? Hey, Moses, therefore go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses was probably like, can I just learn a line dance or something? Like, come on. He goes on to tell Moses in verse 12, I will certainly be with you. God himself says, I will certainly be with you. And this will be a sign to you that I am the one who sent you. Do you know that Moses went on and questioned God five times that we know of? And in hindsight, now knowing the story, when you read it, it's actually kind of annoying because God is like, hey, Moses, this is what we're gonna do. And Moses is like, "Uh, why me? And he's like, and here's how we're gonna do it. And this is what I'm gonna give you. And you have everything you need. And still he's like, but are you sure? And what if, And, and I don't know. And even ends with, please, Lord, send someone else. How many times have we defaulted to let it be someone else? See, Moses was also ashamed of how he spoke and how people would see him. See, what we learn from Moses is that God doesn't call the equipped, but he equips those who he calls, right? I think that's another reason that we don't answer our call. We feel like there's someone else who can do it better. Like Moses, someone else can do it. God can call someone else. 
See, Moses went on to respond to God's call and God did everything that he promised he would do through him. It's time that we start believing what God believes about us. It's time that we start seeing ourselves the way that he sees us, that we prioritize his power over our own abilities. Maybe you're in this room and the whole idea of being called is new to you, not really sure about Jesus, or maybe you're just not sure about your next step or your purpose. There's this powerful story in the Bible, talks about a woman who's been suffering for 12 years. And the book of Mark accounts for it like this. It says, now a woman was suffering from bleeding for 12 years, had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Having heard about Jesus, it's my favorite line in this passage. Having heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing for she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. I was 18 years old, I had just graduated high school and I was leaving USC after partying on their row with all the frat houses and everything. And I remember just walking back to my car, just sloppy, just a train wreck, messy hair, sweaty makeup, probably similar to what I look like right now. So, you know, and I, I, all my friends, they were, they went to USC, but I was about to get in my car and drive back to community college. And I felt unworthy, felt unimportant, I felt dirty. And there was this group of students and they were gathering in the courtyard. And as I was walking by, I recognized a song that they were singing from when I was in church as a little girl and they were singing, here I am to worship. So I got up close and I just sat behind them because I just wanted to listen. And these two girls, they came up to me and they started talking to me. And then they asked if they could pray over me. And I just cried and I cried. Couldn't believe their kindness for me. It was like the shame of everything that I was wearing, everything that I was feeling, how I probably smelled. It just went out the door. There's a verse in Psalm 34, 5 that says, those who look to him are radiant and their face shall never be shamed. And I experienced that in that moment. See, because I too had heard about Jesus. And this was my reaching out to Jesus moment. This was my, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. And that, that moment was pivotal for me in my relationship with Jesus. It changed the course of my life. I spent the next few years just reaching. I was reaching out for worship nights, community groups, Bible studies. And it was in that reaching that God began establishing gifts in my life that will later be used for the call on my life. And I think we have a slide that we're... So this is what Anna at the row thought she was, that's it. And in my reaching, God was establishing so much more. So today I wanna invite you to consider God's call on your life? What would it look like for you to say yes, for you to go out? And others in this room, please, please hear my heart in this. Take that next step and reach out for Jesus. But whether we're reaching out or we're going out, church, can we do something? Can we make a pact this morning that we do either of those with boldness and confidence? Hebrews 4.16 Get that up there. It says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, it's time that we start saying no to the lies that are trying to steal, kill, and destroy us, that we start prioritizing our faith over our fears, that we look to truth instead of listening to lies and that we reach out and that we go out in victory and not walking around with a limp, right? Because Jesus didn't die so that we can go on to question if he still loves us, if we matter, if we have purpose. He never wanted us to feel that, not for a moment. That's what the cross is a picture of to us, that we would look at it and we would never have to question it. So why do we? He needs us 
to heed his call. Not just for our own story, but just like Moses, for those who have not yet been set free. I just pray that for all of us, wherever you're at in life, I pray that we be bold, trusting, confident, believing my God can do the impossible Christians. Our children need to see us step out in faith, our families, this community, because when we do, then people can see what a powerful, faithful, miracle-working God it is that we serve, right? So whether you're reaching out this morning or you go out, let's let God do the rest. Great job, Anna. Man, that's gonna be tough to follow. Good morning, y'all. My name is Bradley Berg, and I'm on, I've been on staff here for um, about five years now. And uh, thank you for having me. And I wanted to honor our pastors, Eric and Darlene. They're currently out of town, but um, thank you so much, wherever you are, for trusting me to speak on the stage where so many amazing messages have been given. So I've been attending here at Shoreline for about 10 years now, and I've worked here for about five. And I have to admit that um, most of the places and jobs that I've found myself in over, over the years, um, I haven't really seen for myself. So uh, I've always kind of approached life with a what now kind of attitude. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about my past and how God has kind of shifted that what now attitude into faithful declarations of um, faithful declarations that uh, I've been able to build a solid foundation for my life on. All right. I'm going to start off with Psalms 143.10. It says, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Now, I first met my wife, Whitney, sitting right over here, my beautiful wife, Whitney. When we were 14 years old, we were freshmen in high school. We were in biology class, and she later admitted that it was her goal that year to make me blush every single day. And she was successful. I ended up having to retake that class. But uh, it turned out to be worth it because I asked her out then on her 15th birthday and she said yes. So uh, at age 18, uh, we, right after high school, we moved into an apartment together with some friends. It was the best for a while. Uh, parties, friends, no parents. Um, we spent that summer doing everything wrong and learning the hard way. We argued, we fought, we reconnected and learned so much about each other. At the end of the summer, we, uh, she had told me one night that she said, uh, I don't think you're ever going to marry me. So right then I said, pack a bag, we're going right now. I surprised myself with that risky statement, <laughs> but I felt confident that I was going to make it work. Uh, so we had, uh, in, in, my, in my young mind, I was like, this was six o'clock in the evening on a Friday night, and we lived in Portland, Oregon, and in my young brain, I thought, we have to drive to Vegas. In the movies, they have, they have 24 hour chapels. So, so we hit the road, and 12 hours later, we arrived in Reno, Nevada, not Las Vegas, um, and ended up getting elo or eloping at a small strip mall chapel in Reno at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Now, getting married young presented so many challenges. We had disagreements, we had times where we realigned, and at one point in our lives, we almost threw in the towel. And the moment the D word was thrown out there, we both decided that that was never gonna be an option, ever. That decision ingrained in me that I was loyal, that I could be and that would forever be a part of who God made me to be. What started as a young, poorly thought out and risky choice in the middle of the night led to four beautiful kids, 18 years of marriage and still going strong. Thank you. God showed me that I was loyal and that my family was important to me and that risk taking was an important part of life. And just to brag a little bit, my two oldest kids were up here on stage during worship and they did a great job. Gavin and Gwenny, love you, great job. Uh, all right, so fast forward a few years after marriage, I was 20 and I had just joined the United States Air Force. And this is a path coming from Oregon that Whitney and I never saw us going down. 
Um, in fact, when I mentioned it, that she laughed out loud, like hysterically out loud. <laughs> kind of threw me off a little bit. But uh, so I served in the military for 10 years, um, two deployments, countless TDYs. Uh, I started my career off as security forces, which is military police in the Air Force. And after months of training, I got to my first base in Colorado Springs and started on night shift. My very first night turned out to be a doozy. I wasn't prepared for it. So I had got there, or I had heard before I got there that you have to be 30 minutes early to be late. So I made sure to give myself plenty of time, plenty of buffer. Um, I got there and I got my stuff ready and I get into formation and we get things started and two minutes later, another airman walks into the room and everything went silent. And my flight chief walked over to him, put him in handcuffs and read him his rights. And I peed a little. <laughs> I said to myself, I'm never gonna be late to anything in my life, ever. And Whitney can attest to this, I'm always early. <laughs> discipline, that job taught me discipline like crazy. Um, can you imagine being two minutes late to work and being arrested for it? <sighs> oh, the, it took me one day in the Operational Air Force to ingrain discipline in my life. So fast forward again seven years this time. Um, I had just changed my Air Force career. We moved down here to Fort Walton Beach, and I was a newly minted geospatial intelligence analyst. And that's just a fancy way of saying I could look at a picture and tell you what I saw. Now, around that time, my wife Whitney was scoping out churches in the area. And see, I didn't grow up in church. I, I'd go occasionally with some friends to, to their churches, but nothing ever really stuck. I, didn't, I wasn't invested in it. And um, I was reluctant to go to any large gathering, let alone one with a bunch of weird church people. But she finally convinced me to give Shoreline a try. So we went, and it was, it was all right. Nothing, nothing like I'd seen before, but um, I wasn't like hooked right away. And, and to be honest, I didn't think I wanted to like it. I don't think I was open to liking it. So we got invited to a 4th of July barbecue um, a couple Sundays in, and again, I reluctantly went, she drugged me there. And uh, so we get to the house. It was a small gathering of like 100 people at the small backyard barbecue. Um, <laughs> so I met the host, and then I met a couple more people, and then like 50 more people in the first 30 minutes. It was really overwhelming. But it was actually a really great time. And these people weren't as weird as I thought they were going to be. The next Sunday, we walked into Shoreline, and all of a sudden, I was greeted by name. I was having a real conversation instead of just like the small talk, how's the weather? And that Sunday, I saw with new eyes. I no longer felt like an imposter, like I shouldn't be there. I felt like I could belong here. So I'm a couple months into attending now at Shoreline, and things are going great, but I'm feeling like there's just, there's something else missing. Like there's something more I could be doing. I had some like regular people I talked to. Um, I could relate to the messages and the music was great, but there was just something that I feel like there was more, um, there was more to it. So one Sunday it was announced that Shoreline was looking for people to serve at a, an event called Bikes or Bust. This is where they collected bikes from the community and uh, they distributed them to local kids for Christmas. And I felt this like excitement in my gut. See, I've always been obsessed with bikes as a kid. I loved riding all types of bikes. Like that was just, it, it really spoke to me. And God was giving me a way to serve the community and all it cost me was a little bit of time and a little bit of elbow grease. So I went and I built box bikes and it was fantastic. And then at the end of the week, I got on the Shoreline website and I signed up for my first serve team. I worked security team. And all of a sudden, like I was hooked on helping. I loved the feeling I got by going out there and serving people with no strings attached. And God knew that I would love to serve. It just took that gut punch of a serve opportunity to be like, this is like your childhood, go, like do it. So now I have one more story for you, and I have to warn you a little bit. This one can be a little controversial in the church world. It's about beer. Um, I love to make my own beer. I've been a home brewer for over 10 years now, and believe it or not, my first life group here at Shoreline that I led and started was called Craft Homebrew Crew. 
It was great. We got together and we got to make a batch of beer and chatted and hang out shoulder to shoulder in my backyard. I was a total nerd about it. I watched all the videos, I read all the books. I had a booth at all the festivals here locally. And actually I experimented and made so much beer I had to give it away to friends and neighbors. And I just loved creating. This really cool hobby turned into a passion for me and a creative release. I felt like this is the direction that God wanted me to go in. It felt perfect. It brought me so much joy to see people when they would try it and enjoy it and give me feedback. I loved it. So Whitney and I made the decision to separate from the military with the intentions of starting a small brewery here locally. I got all my ducks in a row, had local advisors. I volunteered at a larger brewery for experience. Everything was lining up perfectly. That is until it came time to make it happen. And it seemed like with every next step, there was a closed door. This was devastating to me. I risked the livelihood of my family. I risked my career, my passion, and I felt defeated. I felt shame that I couldn't make it happen. It was a really tough time. There were so many nights where I'd ask God why. Why put this in my heart if this isn't the path that you intended for me? Then I remembered something Pastor Donnie had said to me once, and he said, when you feel at a loss, like you're having trouble hearing from God, go back to the last thing God said to you and do that. So I got a job. I went back to the place that I worked in the military just as a civilian this time, and I still felt defeated, but I tried to remain faithful and ask God, Lord, I'm here, what now? Well, the benefit to this job is I got 15 days off a month. So I started coming to the church and I would just hang out, I would read, I would pray. And I started to notice there were things that I could be fixing around the building. So I'd bring my toolbox in and do a few things here and there. And after a couple of months, I realized how much I really loved being around the church, being around people who loved God, who just pursued Jesus with all their time and not just on Sundays. Now, Pastor Eric and Darlene took notice of this and asked me if I would come on board to, t to take care of the building. Now, I remember discussing the opportunity with Whitney and, um, and I came to the realization, God was with me the entire time. He was the one who stirred my passion and creativity for beer that, and that's what I needed to make the decision to leave the military, to pursue my real purpose. I learned that I could sacrifice something dear to me to follow the path that God had for me. Now, I've been here five years now, flexing my creative muscles in different ways and living life with purpose. Now I get to share my life experiences and lessons with the youth to guide and mentor the next generation. This path and passion is nothing that I would have picked for myself. In fact, when I first started serving, I said, I'll do anything except work with kids. We had four of our own. I don't want to work with other people's kids. But now I'm not just creating concoctions and I'm not just building bikes. Like I get to build lives. I get to point to the one who matters and who can fix their problems. I get to share these lessons and show students where they can find the answers. Every one of us goes through seasons of life um, and you may look back on some of them and see pain and heartbreak, but that doesn't mean that God wasn't with you there through it. There's always something to learn about yourself in every season when we reflect uh, how we've grown. We, we, we see God's fingerprints um, all over our lives. So when I reflect on those past seasons of my life, I see how he's showed me how to overcome marriage struggles and come out on the other side and how to be loyal, disciplined, and able to take risks. When I think about the struggles of getting connected in a church and getting to know God, I think about how he's taught me how to serve the community and or serve others and value the community. And when I reflect about past um, passions leading to a life of ministry, I get to see how sacrifice gets to shape the hearts and paths of so many middle, schools, middle schoolers and high schoolers. Now, God has created all of us for good. That doesn't mean bad things won't happen but there's always something to learn and grow from every situation. Now, all these stories and so many more are a way God has shown me what he's created in me. 
you got to embrace the person that God has made you to be. And when you do that, you can say with confidence, I hear you, God. Now what's next? Thank you. Spivey, it's so good to be here with y'all. I'm excited to be up here and honored to be sharing alongside some amazing leaders and people I get to call friends. Um, I want to say thank you to our team here at Shoreline, Pastors Graham and Eric and Darlene and Pastor Donnie, everyone who supported us uh, and empowered us um, to heed the call and step into something new, even though that may be, be a little daunting. Um, but so like Bradley, through my life, through the years, I've seen God develop things in me. I've seen him show me more about my calling. Um, I was born to a teen mom and then adopted at birth by my amazing parents. Um, I think we've got a photo yeah, of us here, <laughs> little Steven up there. But um, my parents were actually in full-time ministry. My dad was a pastor at the time I was born. And so I grew up in the church, essentially. Although despite that, despite growing up in church, there were many times through the years, uh, through middle school, high school, and college, when I questioned and was so uncertain of the call and the purpose that he had for me in each season. Even now, I just finally feel like I really understand and have heard clearly from him on what my purpose is in this season here at Shoreline. In fact, um, I, I find myself in a very mixed stage right now of still understanding those things that God's been wanting to develop in me, um, while also realizing part of that call uh, is to give to this next generation as part of our, our tribe team, um, but also recognizing that I'm still very young. I'm only 25 years old, and I have so much left to learn. Um, even as I was writing this, I was writing that statement, and then I thought about it and just kind of laughed because I said, I don't even know what that means. Like, I have so much left to learn. I don't have any idea the implications that have on my next year or five year or 10 years. Um, but what I do know is that I need people around me, people who have walked where I'm walking now and have walked even where I'll walk 10 years from now, people to guide me and pour into me that I can receive wisdom from. People like Pastor Graham or even Bradley or Donnie, people who are able to come to me and say, hey, I've been where you've been right now. I see what you're going through. Let me guide you in this and help you along the way. Or maybe they come in and say, hey, I see you're going this direction and that's not gonna work out well for you. Let me help steer you back the right way. Or even saying, coming to me and letting me know that they see a blind spot that I don't see. And to be honest, to be really transparent with y'all, I'm still growing in that and that's not something I'm good at accepting. I get really defensive when someone comes to me like that. My, my first instinct is to say, whoa, hold up, like back off, like thanks, I appreciate what you're trying to do, like love you man, but no, like that's not, that's not true. Like you're not seeing the whole picture, you don't know what I've got going on, I've got my life together, it's great, you know. Um, and through the years, this is something I've had to manage because I, I've always liked to be the guy who's got all his ducks in a row, like Bradley said, or, or someone who's a go-getter, independent, um, doesn't need help from other people. And through the years, that's held true in some parts of my life. I was a straight-A student in, in school. I was a leader in my church groups and college. Even here at Shoreline, I like, when working with our teams, I want to be the one who has an answer to every question or the one who has a solution to any problem that they bring me. But what I'm learning and what I've learned is that I can't do it alone. I can't do it on my own. Uh, and more than that, the more experience I gain, the more qualifications I feel like I have. God's shown me in each season that actually, as I learn more, I'm realizing how unqualified and how unequipped I feel to do what God's leading me into in each next season. It says in Proverbs 11:14, where there's no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there's victory. And then again in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, all of us, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Some of the biggest moments of growth in my life and of understanding stepping into my calling have come when I've been able to receive counsel and guidance from someone, whether that's, again, a mentor, my parents, or even a friend. When I've been able to receive that with humility, take that to God for confirmation, meditate on it, and then actually apply that to my life, I've been able to see God grow me in leaps and bounds. When I've been able to realize that no amount of qualification or experience is enough, 
I've been able to surrender my pride for God's plan and what he had for me. Those are the times when God is able to move in all of us and add on to us new things and new, new passions, new ideas, uh, even new grace for the season ahead that he's calling us toward. But once we begin to understand our calling, we're faced with the reality that there's more to the equation, more than just the understanding and knowing how God has made us, what our purpose is. We actually have to take action like Brad and Anna talked about. Jesus called people to follow him and do life with him, not just to believe in the idea of him. It took action and boldness. And it's great when we figure out our purpose and we get to walk in that, we get to put all the pieces of the puzzle together, but we're not meant to do life alone and we're not meant to, to use our purpose in a bubble. In fact, we're called to walk and live in that calling, to then give to the next generation and also receive from those ahead of us. So what does that look like? Let's just start with the living in, in the calling. How do, we, how do we do that? You know, you're sitting here, you're saying, what does that even mean, this word calling? Kind of weird. Um, but like Anna and Brad mentioned, there's action and courage required to step out and accept what we probably already know God has in store for us. That thing maybe that's in our hand, that gifting, that passion. And maybe, maybe you're holding that behind your back and you're trying to hide it because you don't want to accept what's daunting and maybe scary. Maybe even you look and you see someone else, like Anna talked about, someone, and you see them with the same passions and maybe the similar gifting you have. And you think, oh wow, maybe, maybe I can do what they're doing. But then you look and you see, oh, well, they've been doing it for a few years and they're good at what they do. And, and they're better at it than I'll be. So, so I guess that's not for me. I guess that's not my gifting. I guess that's not my calling because it's already theirs. You know, I'll just stay in my lane over here in my little bubble. If that's you this morning, I want to reiterate what Anna said. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those who he has called. Just like Moses, he chose someone with a stutter and with a terrible speech impediment to go and speak on his behalf to rescue his people. God's not going to choose the best motivational speaker in the world to come and preach his message. The good news is with our calling, we don't have to figure this out alone. We have a community of like-minded people who are also seeking and asking and trusting God for their own way forward, their own path that we can lean on. People in my life, I'm able to lean on my community here at Shoreline. Again, friends, my parents, I'm able to go to them and, and maybe I have something that God's stirring in me. Maybe there's a passion I feel him developing in me and I'm not sure what that looks like or what the next step is so I can go to them and get support, even if that support's only in the form of a listening ear. In looking back on my life in each stage, I wouldn't have been able to get through it and learn what God was trying to teach me without people who were willing to invest in me. People who were willing to be there and help guide me in that calling, to help give of their time and even resources to point me in the right direction. And that's what each of us is called to do as well. We're called to give to the next generation, give of our time, our energy, our resources even. But we're not just called to give to be, you know, good people or to check a box or, you know, generosity is great, which it is. But the point is to give so we can build up, equip, and empower this next generation. We can help these young people find their calling because when they begin to live in their own calling, they'll start giving to those younger than them. Generation after generation, God has a plan. I get to be part of this and see this so beautifully every Wednesday night at Tribe with our students. Um, I get the privilege to be there, to walk with them through each season, through the things they're going through, the hardships, the questions they have, the hard questions. And I get to come alongside them and say, I've been where you've been. I've dealt with those things. I've had those same questions and I don't have all the answers now, but I want to walk with it through you. I want to walk with them through each season, through each struggle, help them try and, and determine their own calling and where God is moving in their life. So if you're sitting here today and maybe you're unsure of your calling, of your next step in life, maybe your next step, like Anna said, is just to grab onto Jesus. Just embrace even the hem of his garment to be able to begin to let him reveal to you that you're not just called to live in a bubble, but he has a beautiful picture of fullness for you. And maybe you've found that like Brad has. Maybe you've walked through and seen him reveal time after time what he's created in you, who he's made you to be. 
but maybe again, you're just living in that for yourself. You're like, okay, God, it's just me and you. I know that I'm, I'm committed. I know that I'm loyal and I'm gonna be loyal to you. Maybe that's even in just your own family. And it's great to have that ministry in your family and with your personal relationship, but we're called to more. We're called to give to the next generation, receive from those around us who've gone ahead of us or those beside us, or maybe even receive from those younger than us who can offer fresh passion, fresh energy. Maybe you have dreams that have grown stagnant and died as you've gotten discouraged over the years, and that can be reinvigorated by, by reaching out to this next generation. Because when we're able to receive from those around us, we unlock a whole realm of support and guidance that God is giving us in the form of the people he's placed in our lives. I think all of us at different times have, have pleaded and begged with God, you know, God, speak to me. I wanna hear you clearly. I wanna know you. And his answer is the people that are already around us in our life. Maybe the person sitting right beside you who God's gonna speak into your life with. And we can be those people for others as well by giving of ourselves and speaking into them. So I don't know how long this season is for me. I don't know what God has in store for me, but I know right now here at Shoreline, being in ministry in the thick of it full time is where he has me. Giving to this next generation, receiving from those who are ahead of me who have so much to offer. And I don't know what's next. I don't know how long or what's next, but I know whatever comes, I have a community and I have support around me from people God has gifted me in my life. And when I move into the next season, maybe I won't have those same people or those same relationships, but I know God will continue to guide me to where I'm supposed to receive and where I'm supposed to give out of my calling. When we're fully committed to heeding the call God has on our life, living in that calling, it will naturally yield the giving and receiving. And the beautiful thing is, when all the gears fit together, we enter the fullness of what God has for us. What he's designed for us to be is the church, not a building, but a movement. A movement that when we partner with the work of Jesus, the supernatural, there's a supernatural multiplication more than we could ever do on our own or ever understand. But that multiplication creates a movement that has the power to change the world in alignment with the work that Jesus begun in his time here on earth. You, each of you, all of us have that opportunity today to say yes to partner with that, to be willing to receive, to step out into a call that might be daunting, it might be scary, it's a lot bigger than we probably know it is. I know there's so much I still don't see, but I'm excited to step into what God has and be able to be part of that, the blessings that he gives us through the people in our life, both to receive from and give to. So if you wanna take that step this morning, I wanna pray with you now for clarity and guidance. And maybe in here you feel God pulling on your heart, you feel your passions, those things that he's built in you, those desires stirring. We have some amazing men and women over here in the prayer corner who would love to talk to you after service. Maybe there's someone there who's going through exactly what you're battling, what you're fighting through right now, and they can give you that guidance. They can be the hands and feet of God for you today to, to minister to you in that way. So I encourage you after service, go and see them if that's you. But let me pray for us this morning. Father God, we thank you just for your guidance. The fact that you are an ever-present God in every moment with each and every person through every generation. You love us and you care about the things we care about. You wanna help bring us into the fullness, all of the, the good things that you prepared for us long before we were even born, Father. I ask that you would let there be a light bulb moment for every person in this room today even if that, that light bulb is just saying, keep going, keep taking one step at a time where I'm leading you. God, reveal yourself to our hearts this morning in the way that only you can in such a deep and personal way because you know us better than we even know ourselves. We thank you, Lord, for all you've given us and we ask that you'd give us strength and wisdom as we move forward to give and receive from those around us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good night of living. Easily my favorite weekend of the whole year. Uh, this service has been, wasn't that fantastic? Um, you know what I love is that when they talk about culture in a church, they say it's uh, when it, it turns from things that you do into who you are, right? That's when it becomes an identity. And, and I love that our um, 
integrating the different generations is not what we do. It's not a task list. It's not, it's not on the calendar. It's who we are. Uh, when we talk about generosity in here, serve day, go do that. That, that. What a great first step of recognizing your calling, of stepping into a passion is to just serve. When we give here, even on the weekends, we say we don't want it to just be something that we do. We want generosity to be who we are. This is the church. This is Shoreline Church. Um, we, we do pride ourselves here uh, at Shoreline Church on being a church that is easy to invite to um, because maybe you have somebody that you know they're like, man, I wish they would have heard this, right? Or we'd say that the word of God, that scripture is, yeah, it's challenging, but it's not confusing. We want everybody that you know to know that they are loved and that God has the next step for them. So just in a second, we're going to pass these buckets for, uh, for the giving. And again, irrational generosity for this church manifests itself in this way. If you're an adult in here in need of food, shelter, or clothing, we encourage you, reach in the buckets that are on your row and use the loose cash to meet your needs. And while you do, we got a fun little teaser because next week we're starting our October series creature feature. This is our third year in a row having some fun with this. So this is going to be a fun one to invite somebody to. There's invite cards on your chair. Check out this video. All the buckets are being passed. of the creatures lurking in the dark beyond. But now, it's time we confront the monster within. Join us, if you dare, as Shoreline Church presents Creature Feature 3D. I was like, dang, Dom, that was good, man. That was part of the video. Hey, uh, we're going to have some fun with that. Come back next week, invite somebody. I'll be speaking next week. I might even wear that flannel for you guys. So see you guys next week.